All right, it's 9.20, so let's begin. Uh, so last time we wrapped up talking about Paxos and consensus, and uh, if there are questions left over from last time, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, post your questions in chat or, um, or just ask me whenever. It's a tough topic. It's often not covered at the undergrad level uh, at all. I certainly didn't learn about consensus algorithms when I was in undergrad. Uh, so, uh, so if you're still struggling, uh, just know that you're not alone, uh, and we're happy to help. Uh, today we're going to move on to something new. So for Monday, if you've been reading announcements or looking at the schedule, you know that I asked you to read the Dynamo paper for Monday, the Amazon Dynamo paper. Uh, so this is one of the most uh, influential distributed systems papers of the last 20 years or so. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, highly cited, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're going to read it and talk about it. And today I want to introduce some concepts or start introducing some concepts that will be useful for you to keep in mind uh, as you read it. Um, so we've been talking about, about strong consistency between replicas. Uh, and we talked about how you could use primary backup replication or chain replication uh, as a replication strategy that ensures strong consistency. Uh, and uh, we talked about how, in a sense, uh, strong, consistency, uh, strong consistency ultimately relies on consensus. Uh, because uh, if you want to be fault tolerant, then you have to have some coordinator. And that coordinator should really be several processes that are acting as one. Uh, so I really want to emphasize this. If you want to implement a system that's strongly consistent, and you want it to be tolerant to nodes failing, then you're probably going to need to have some kind of consensus mechanism sooner or later. Um, so if you were thinking of implementing homework three, uh, which asks for causal consistency, by just implementing, say, primary backup replication, uh, then you're, you're going to have to account for replicas failing and having to get everyone to, uh, to know who the new primary is if the primary fails. Uh, and that requires consensus. So that's not actually the, the easy way out of doing the assignment. It's actually the hard way out. So I won't stop you if you want to try to implement consensus in your spare time, but that's not what I recommend for doing the assignment. So the trouble with strong consistency is that it's hard to enforce. Uh, so think about our, our standard total order anomaly example that we've seen so many times. So this is a total order anomaly. Is it a causal anomaly? No. How do you know? How do you know that it's not a causal anomaly? Well, you can't use vector clocks to figure out which event is supposed to go first, can you? No. Here's, here's what would happen if we tried. If this event here were say one zero 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 so I'm just doing the usual vector clock thing of saying um, I'm saying both sends and receives are events every process starts out with zeros um, uh, when you send an event you send its vector clock when you receive an event uh, you merge the local clock with the received vector clock. I think it would look like that. So what happens when we compare these two vector clocks on these two events? Is either one of them bigger? Somebody asked if this should be, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that should be one. Okay, so these two vector clocks. Is either one of these bigger? Mm -mm. 
So these two events here are causally independent. In other words, causality tells us nothing about how to order them. So if these had been rights, like assign 3 to x and assign 4 to x, then we would end up with different values for x here on these two replicas. Well, but we want replicas to be consistent. So what do we do? Well, one option could be to run a consensus protocol, like we've been talking about, to get these replicas to agree. Uh, but as we've seen, consensus is expensive, it requires sending a lot of messages, and it might not even terminate. So what I would rather do is try to find some sort of way to make it so that the order in which these updates arrive at these replicas doesn't matter. And often, that's the right thing to do, because often the order in which updates arrive really does not matter very much. So what's an example of a situation in which the order of two updates doesn't matter? Um, so, well, one situation would be if different keys are being written to by these, by these two different primaries, or, or by these different clients, right? Um, so if this were writing to y rather than x, then we would end up with this set, uh, let's see, we would have x equals 3 here and y equals 4 here. So we would end up with this set of keys on both replicas. And we don't really care that the updates land in different orders because the replicas end up being in the same state eventually. Now, would this give you strong consistency? Uh, recall that strong consistency means that clients can't tell that the data is replicated. Do you think that if I just said, okay, client one is only allowed to update uh, key X, client two is only allowed to update key Y, um, would this give you strong consistency according to the definition that we sketched out before? No, it wouldn't, uh, exactly, because clients can still do reads during this intermediate time before both the updates have arrived on the replicas. So we said strong consistency means clients can't tell that the data is replicated. Um, so if this client were making queries um, about, about why, and they were making those queries during this time before the, the update to Y uh, had necessarily landed here on replica one, then whether then the value that they read for Y would depend on which replica they talked to. Um, so this wouldn't give you strong consistency. But it's arguably still better than the situation that we were in before uh, when both replicas were updating X and the replicas ended up different. At least here, uh, the replicas eventually agreed. Um, so we can give a name to this property uh, of replicas eventually coming to agree. Uh, it's called eventual consistency. So informally, we can say, uh, and, and we, won't, we won't worry about a, a formal definition, uh, but informally, we can say eventual consistency means that Replicas eventually agree if clients stop submitting updates. So what kind of property does eventual consistency look like to you? Does it look like a safety property or does it look like a liveness property?
Right. It's a liveness property. So the fact that it has this word eventually in it is a hint, right? So it's a property that can't be violated in a finite execution. Um, so the first example we had, where one rep replica ended up with x equals 3 and the other one ended up with x equals 4, um, in that one, even if you had that, you could still satisfy eventual consistency if you then implemented some mechanism that made the replicas agree, uh, which would probably involve them sending more messages, right? So eventual consistency is very different um, from those other consistency models that we studied before. Um, so before we talked about uh, um, we talked about strong consistency. and causal consistency and FIFO consistency. And these are all just a sampling actually of, the, of the, um, the many consistency models that you can have. These are all safety properties. So these can be violated in a finite execution. With eventual consistency, it's a liveness property. So you can't write down a finite execution where it's been violated. You can only write down a finite execution where it hasn't been satisfied yet. So I make this distinction because, um, so eventual consistency has been uh, a buzzword in the last uh, 15 years or so. And sometimes people try to lump it in with these other consistency models, but it, it, it really doesn't belong in this category at all because it's a different kind of property. Um, so, it, um, so it's a liveness property. Um, but there actually is a safety property that we can write down um, that, that distinguishes between uh, those different executions that we talked about before. Um, so I will write down that property now. Um, it's called strong convergence. So strong convergence says that replicas that have delivered the same set of updates have equivalent state. So notice the word set here. So in this picture, uh, where we had x uh, set, or we had, we had client 1 setting the value of x to 3, and we had client 2 setting the value of y to 4, um, notice that those updates came in in a different order. So these replicas didn't deliver updates in the same order. Um, but they delivered the same set of updates right at this point. At this point, you can say that the set of updates that both have delivered is the same. And so these replicas are strongly convergent. So the same set of updates in whatever order, regardless of the order they came in on, at, if they've delivered the same set of updates, if then that they have an equivalent state, we say that they're strongly convergent. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about a system that has strong eventual consistency. And strong eventual consistency is a combination of eventual consistency and strong convergence.
I'll just write down the, the definition of, of EC again here, uh, just so that it's all on one page. So strong eventual consistency is a combination of, of those two things. So strong eventual consistency is uh, a combination of a safety and a liveness property, because eventual consistency, we said, is a liveness property. And then this is a safety property. Uh, so, so SEC is safety plus liveness. So we sort of cheated a little uh, when we said have client one write to x and have client two write to y. That seems like a pretty easy way to get strong convergence, right? Like, and it's also pretty unrealistic. Like, only let one client write to one particular key, and and that doesn't that doesn't seem like a like a restriction that we really want to have on our system. So. Can anybody think of another way that we could ensure strong convergence that would still allow multiple clients to write to the same key? Are there any ideas? How could we let both clients write to X and still get strong convergence? Well, okay. Um, yeah, you could you could run a consensus protocol and then say don't deliver an update uh, until you've had consensus agree on what order to deliver the updates. Um, so that would be one way to do it. Um, okay, um, but c is there any way to do it that's like maybe a little less heavyweight than having to run a consensus protocol? What do you think? So here's a hint. What if you kept both rights? What if you did something like this? So client one does its right, client two does its right. So at this point here on replica one, x is three. But instead of just saying x can only be a, a single uh, number, we could say x is a set of numbers. And then here, when that four arrives, now x is the set three and four. Likewise here, X is the set containing just four, and here X is the set containing four and three. So since sets are unordered, uh, these are equal at this point. So replica R1 will apply this right, 
and when this other right comes in, um, it sees that it's concurrent. It looks at its causal history, right? Sees that it's concurrent, and then it saves both values of x. And replica R2 will do the same thing in the other order. Um, so the only issue now is that a client doing a read after this point will, will get both values. So now it's up to the client to do any sort of conflict resolution themselves, right? And the, the appropriate way to resolve the conflict will depend on the application. Um, but here we actually do have strong convergence because the replicas do have the same set of state after delivering the same set of updates. It required us to compromise on the on in a way, right? Because it, it because now when the client does a read, it's going to see multiple things. Um, but it does preserve strong convergence. So here's an example of. Uh, of this situation that's deeply important to Amazon. So let's say that these two replicas here are both storing my Amazon shopping cart. Um, so let's say uh, client one is me with my laptop. And let's say that so here's my shopping cart, replicated. Let's say that with my laptop, I add a book to my shopping cart. So here's a picture of the book. So that right arrives here. Now here's the set of what my shopping cart contains. Meanwhile, uh, here's me with my phone. And with my phone, I add a pair of pants to my cart. So then we get here, and now replicas have uh, both replicas have both the book and the pants. So now a client does a read to ask what my cart is. Um, and instead of getting one value, uh, they get two values. Um, actually, a better way to understand this, um, this is going to be kind of messy, but um, if you think of this set here um, as being the contents of my shopping cart, so this set is what replica one thinks the contents of my cart is. This set here is what replica two thinks the contents of my card is. Um, so a better way to, uh, to kind of explain this here would be to say, there's actually two sets. So I have a set of two sets, the set containing the book and the set containing the pants. That's a little bit messy, but, um, but it's actually a more accurate way to, to explain the situation. So at this point, a client does a read to ask what the cart is. And what they get back is two different carts. They get the cart containing the book, and they get the cart containing the pants. So those are actually two different versions of the shopping cart. What do you think the client should do to resolve the conflict? Yeah, just combine them, right? So the client should just take the union of those two sets. 
So the cart at this point actually becomes both book and pants. The way that I drew it before, that, that uh, combination was actually happening here. Um, but it would be more accurate, uh, actually, to say that it happens at this point on the client side. The client does the combination of those two cards. This specific situation is actually discussed in the Dynamo paper. So this definitely result, uh, depends on the individual application, right? So in some applications, uh, this won't be the right mechanism to resolve a conflict. Um, but in this particular application, it is the one that makes sense. There's a whole lot more to say about this, um, and maybe I'll have time later on to talk about it more. Um, but uh, I want to spend the rest of my time today on other things, on other aspects of, of, the, um, of the Dynamo paper. So um, th this, is, this is kind of just a taste of this problem of application-specific conflict resolution. There's actually a whole lot more to say about this. Uh, it's a pretty huge topic. Um, so um, if you have unanswered questions, I'm not surprised. Uh, and, but hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to some of them later. Uh, but I want to move on to talk about some of the other things uh, in the Dynamo paper, because the paper is really just like a grab bag of different distributed systems concepts. So we have a lot of other things to discuss as well. OK, so setting this aside for now, another concept that will come up um, in the Dynamo paper as you read it is the, the concept, concept of network partitions. What does this term mean? Uh, anyone know? Yeah, so if you have some sort of network of communicating computers, right, you could imagine some kind of scenario where some sub subset of them can talk to each other and the other subset can talk to each other. Um, but for some reason, there can't be any communication between the groups. So that's a network partition. You can also have a situation where you have a client and the client is for some reason able to connect to machines on both sides of a partition, but for some reason they can't talk to each other. And then rarely you might have a situation where side one can send messages to side two, but side two can't send messages to side one. So all of these are network partitions. So Network partitions are an unfortunate fact of life in distributed systems. Conveniently, we have a way to talk about them using the fault models that we've already discussed. So we can just use the omission model, right? And we can say that in this case, um, any messages that cross the partition line are considered lost messages. By the way, uh, don't confuse the concept of a network partition uh, with the, the concept of data partitioning. So a network partition is when parts of a network can't communicate. And 
and it's generally considered to be a bad thing, right? Data partitioning, on the other hand, refers to when you have more data than will fit on one machine, so you have to split it over multiple machines and you have to make a decision about what to put where. Um, so that's, that's data partitioning, also known as sharding, uh, and we're going to talk about that as well. So this is one of those many situations in distributed systems where we have an, this unfortunate overlap in terminology. So data partitioning is not intrinsically bad. Network partitions are bad. Okay, so this is a concept that's going to come up in the, the Dynamo paper. Um, and um, so it's discussed at length in the paper, uh, or it's, it's used at length in the paper, so I want you to understand what it is. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and you can reason about it using the omission model that you already know about it, but um, in case you hadn't encountered this term before, now, now you know what it is. Um, there's another piece of terminology that I want to introduce, um, and it's the notion of availability. So Dynamo claims to be a, quote, highly available, unquote, system. They put that claim right in the title of the paper. So what, is, what do they mean by highly available? Any ideas? What, what the heck does that mean? So because they, make, they, they describe their system as highly available, that kind of suggests that availability isn't an all or nothing thing, right? It's not a property that's either on or off. If something can be highly available, then arguably it could be a little bit available or kind of available or mostly available, right? Um, so that's the, the, this notion of availability as a spectrum rather than an on and off thing is, is the right way to talk about availability. Um, so. I'll define if, so perfect availability isn't really a thing. Um, it's not really possible, but, but I'll define it anyway. I'll say perfect availability is every request receives a response. This actually isn't, a great definition because you probably also want the responses to be fast, right? Uh, and a lot of real distributed systems work is about that. A lot of the Dynamo paper is about that. Um, but it's an okay starting point, right? If every request receives a response, uh, we're in good shape. So let's say that you're trying to do some kind of replicated system. Uh, say it's primary backup replication, just for an example. And primary backup replication provides strong consistency. So let's say we have a primary couple of replicas. We try to write x equals 5. But suppose that right here, there's a network partition. So the primary can't reach the backups. What does P do? Does it acknowledge the write to the client? So we're imagining that this new write comes in. And at the moment that P is supposed to go through the usual primary backup replication protocol, it finds that it can't reach the backups because there's a network partition right here. So 
So would it acknowledge the clients? Well, I guess it depends, but normally under the protocol that we've talked about so far, under primary backup replication, it would not. Um, because it would because the protocol is that it has to write to all the backups and then the backups have to acknowledge the primary, right? And they can't do that right now. So it can't respond to the client. So that sucks, right? An alternative approach would be to go ahead and acknowledge the client. And then write to the backups later on whenever the partition heals. But what's wrong with doing it that way? What if it never heals? Sure, yeah, so yeah, you don't know how long this partition is going to take to heal. You generally think of a network partition as being a short-lived thing, right? Um, but, but, um, but yeah, the, the partition could take an arbitrarily long time to heal, um, so that's not great. Um, well, what else is wrong with this scenario? Let's say, that, let's say that the partition does heal sooner or later. What else is wrong with this? Well, yeah, what if, what if the primary crashes, right? The backups don't have all of the updates. So they disagree with the primary at this point. So now if the primary crashes and a backup had to take over, you've lost a write. The client won't see its most recent writes, even though the client was acknowledged. So the client ought to be able to have some trust when it gets this okay here. The client ought to be able to have some trust that the that the storage system actually got its right and knows about it and won't forget. Um, so, so that's bad too. So both of these situations are bad, right? Um, the situation where, where the primary has to sit here and, and wait for the network partition to heal before it can talk to the backups uh, is bad because the partition could take an arbitrary long time to, to, to heal. Uh, and, 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 it, and so it would be pretty slow, right? And then the other situation is also bad because, because you could lose, da lose data if the primary crashes. So neither approach is ideal. Um, but unfortunately, since network partitions are a fact of life, we have to make a choice between these two very unappealing options. So what do we do? And this is this, the, the choice that, that primary backup replication makes, or any system that enforces strong consistency, the choice that such a system makes is to prioritize consistency at the expense of availability. So under the primary backup protocol that we've talked about, this acknowledgement wouldn't happen. or at least it wouldn't happen until the partition healed. And if, you're, if you were defining availability as every request receives a response, uh, let's say within some fixed amount of time, then there would be no guarantee that that partition would heal uh, in time for you to make that, uh, um, in time for your, you to honor that agreement. Um, okay, so somebody's suggesting in chat, yeah, you could tell the client, uh, that we accepted the right, but that there's no backup. Yeah, so that's an option that a real system could do, right? The, the, um, the primary could say, okay, we've got the right, but no promises, man. Uh, we're just going to do our best, but this right might get lost, you know, if I fail. Um, okay, or it could be something like temporary failure, try later. Okay, so like that, that would be a sort of, that, that, that would kind of, um, uh, that, that would satisfy this availability criterion if you just said, try again later. Uh, but that would be a really um, unsatisfying way of satisfying this availability requirement here. Um, so it's not really in the spirit of what we mean by availability. Um, okay, so the choice that a strongly consistent system makes is to prioritize consistency at the expense of availability. 
which means that um, if there's a network partition, which is hopefully short-lived, then it's going to sit around and wait for that network partition to heal before uh, responding to the client. And it's going to make sure that that write uh, makes it to all the backups before responding to the client. Um, this is true not just of primary backup, but of in any strongly consistent uh, replication system. The choice that systems like Dynamo make is to prioritize availability at the expense of consistency. So you can't have it both ways. And that's true regardless of the replication strategy that you're using. Um, so, so more generally, um, let's just say that you have, let's say that you have two replicas. Uh, with a partition between them. And let's say that you had a client who could talk to both. So this is no longer primary backup. Um, this is a different sort of system where clients are allowed to talk to, dif to different replicas. Um, so let's say that the client uh, uh, could talk to either replica, but the replicas can't talk to each other. Um, so say the client does a write. and it gets an acknowledgment. Let's say that the both, both the replicas thought uh, x was 4 to begin with. So here, x has changed to 5 on replica 1. Uh, but replica 2 doesn't know about that. Then if the client tries to read x over here, Now the client asks R2 what X is. So R2 has a choice, right? R2 could just say X equals four. If R2 says X equals four, that violates strong consistency. because the client knows that, that she just wrote five. Or R2 could say, well, I can't tell you what X is until I talk to R1. And that would violate perfect availability. So this is a fundamental trade-off. So between these two things, you can't have it both ways. Uh, and we'll talk about that more uh, in a little while. Um, let's pause and do a quiz question. And actually, I want to talk about um, the last few quiz responses. So I think the I think the last one we talked about was um, was quiz number thirteen. So so let's talk about fourteen. Um, okay. So this question was, um, what are the three properties that consensus algorithms try to satisfy? Uh, so uh, we've talked about this a bunch, but um, so uh, uh, so termination they try to they try to terminate uh, validity. They try to have it be so that the value they choose is one of the proposed values uh, and agreement. They try to make it so that everybody actually agrees on one of the proposed values. Um, so uh, validity, termination, and agreement. And, uh, and as we've seen, uh, a consensus uh, algorithm can't actually satisfy all three. So that's what we were looking for there. Uh, uh, validity, termination, and agreement. Um, this next one, uh, what are the three milestones in a run of the Paxos algorithm? Um, so people wrote all kinds of things for this one. Some people wrote, again, uh, validity, termination, and agreement. So that, that wasn't the answer we were looking for here. Um, so, so what are the three milestones? Um, so we said uh, the first milestone is the point where uh, uh, 
proposer gets a, a, a majority of acceptors uh, to promise a particular value. Uh, that's the first milestone. Uh, that has to happen uh, before you can move on to the second milestone. Uh, the second milestone is when a majority of acceptors send accepted messages for a particular... I'm sorry, I probably just said something wrong. What I meant, I, I said value a second ago, but I meant proposal number. So, um, so the first milestone is when a, when a proposer gets a majority of acceptors to promise a particular proposal number. That's what I meant to say. The second milestone is when you get a majority of acceptors to send the accepted messages for a particular proposal number and a particular value. Um, and that's also the point at which consensus is reached, even though not everybody knows it yet. And the third milestone is the point uh, at which everybody finds out that consensus is reached. So everybody has heard from a majority of acceptors about the, the value upon which you've reached consensus. Uh, so that's what we're looking for here. Uh, the next quiz. Um, so those three properties, uh, validity, termination, and agreement. Um, uh, we are asking, which does Paxos fail to satisfy, and how could this happen? Um, so Paxos fails to satisfy termination, and how could this happen? It could happen if uh, you have dueling proposers. So we saw an example of this last time, but you could have a situation where, uh, where two proposers keep on proposing higher and higher proposal numbers, but they're never, never able to get a majority of acceptors to actually accept a, a, a value that they're proposing. So that, that can happen uh, under Paxos. And that's what we were looking for there. Okay, so those are, hopefully now we're caught up on, on quizzes uh, from the last few classes. And here is today's. So I'll send out the link.
We'll wait a minute longer. Yeah, it looks like the number of responses is more or less quiescent. So let's uh, let's let's move on. So uh, somebody just asked um, how closely uh, how closely to read the paper. Um, so I mean, this is kind of a this this is a a difficult question. So we're going to we're going to hit the highlights of it uh, in class, uh, and um, so any anything that we discuss in class uh, to do with the paper, uh, you should consider fair game for things that I expect expect you to know. Um, so um, I think reading the paper, uh, I, I think it would be a good idea for you to read the paper and make a note of anything that you don't understand and then bring those questions to class. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's possible that, um, that some of the paper is ambiguous, right? And we don't necessarily have to um, uh, understand every detail, but, um, but I want you to understand the big ideas. Um, it doesn't hurt to take notes. I like to, when I read a paper, I like to read, uh, while you know, with my uh, with my pencil in hand, and write on the paper as I'm reading it. Uh, so that's how I read. I, I can't really read effectively unless I'm writing as well. Uh, so so I would I would suggest doing that. But that's that's not necessarily how everybody learns best. So that's that's kind of up to you. Um, I'm I'm not going to tell you how to study. That's something that that everybody has to figure out how to do that effectively for themselves. So there's really just one more thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is, uh, so coming back to this picture here, um, where we said, um, okay, so, so Replica 2 has this choice to make, right? Um, if, she, if she returns x is 4, well, she knows right now if, that if she tries to ping r1, um, r1 is unreachable. Um, so, so she doesn't know that she has the most up-to-date value of x, right? Um, she could return x right now, um, and that would violate strong consistency, um, whether whether she knows it or not, right? Whether whether she realizes it or not, the client would certainly be able to tell that their previous write to x wasn't saved. So from the client's perspective, strong consistency would be violated, and that's how we define strong consistency. It has to do with what the client sees. Um, and then this other option, if Replica 2 says, I can't tell you, or says something like, um, "Well, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, what I have now, but you know, you shouldn't trust it." 
Um, I guess that falls more under the strong consistency. Yeah, so there's no real good answer here, right? And this is, uh, this is a fundamental limitation of distributed systems. Um, so there's a name for this, this fundamental limitation. Um, and it's, it's traditionally known as, as CAP, uh, which stands for Consistency, Availability, Partition Tolerance. Um, so one way to think of CAP, um, which I would argue is not entirely accurate, uh, is uh, you can't have all three. So consistency, availability, partition tolerance, pick at most two. So that's kind of the traditional way of talking about CAP. Um, but it's actually much more subtle than that because uh, this, is, this is not just any notion of consistency, but this is strong consistency. And this is not just any notion of availability, but it's perfect availability. So even though you indeed can't have strong consistency and perfect availability and partition tolerance, for the reasons uh, that we just sketched out here in this little example, um, it doesn't actually matter that much because you can provide a system that has a good enough availability. Note that Amazon doesn't claim that Dynamo has perfect availability. They claim that it, that it has high availability, right? Um, so what they do is they choose to turn the knob more toward availability and compromise a bit on consistency. Uh, some other systems turn the knob toward consistency uh, and choose to compromise on availability. So this isn't like an either or sort of thing. Uh, instead, it's a thing where you make particular design choices in your system that allow you to prioritize one over the other. And there are different points in that design space. It's not just a binary, I'm going to pick availability or I'm going to pick consistency. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's much more of a spectrum uh, where you can choose uh, more consistency or more availability. Um, you typically don't want to sacrifice on partition tolerance because partitions just happen. You can't avoid them. Now, some systems are going to be more vulnerable to partitions than others, and so that might inform your choices, uh, but, uh, but you, can't, uh, uh, you can't entirely avoid them in a distributed system. So Dynamo makes a choice that falls more toward the more availability end of the spectrum. And other systems might make other choices. Um, but don't think of this as like an either or sort of thing. That's just about everything that I had to cover for today. And we have about five minutes left. Uh, anybody have any questions? Questions left over from Paxos stuff or questions left over from the midterm? Hmm. A question in chat was, uh, where does MongoDB lie on this line? Um, yeah, so, so I would put Mongo like further toward the availability end. Although another thing to point out here is that these systems are configurable, right? Um, and you can, uh, so I don't know the, the details of Mongo, um, but there are configuration settings that you can use to, um, uh, uh, to, to, Kind of tweak where this 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 setting lies. Um, 
so with Dynamo, actually, um, so we're going to talk about, um, we'll talk about this next time, uh, but, uh, but you could actually configure Dynamo uh, in a way where it falls further toward this more consistency setting. Um, uh, because it's 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 what it provides what's called the quorum consistency, which is configurable. Um, uh, I I don't know if Mongo does that too. Um, I think in general I would put Mongo more on the more availability side. Um, it's just that with Dynamo, the whole point of Dynamo is that they want to use it in this uh, more availability uh, prioritizing mode. And that was one of the things that made this paper so influential uh, because um, so there was in, in, at the time that this, that the Dynamo paper was published, which was in 2007, um, the, the tradition in, uh, in distributed systems research uh, was, was, to, was to prioritize strong consistency and just assume that strong consistency was always what you wanted and so there wasn't um, there wasn't much research into this spectrum, and in fact, the, a, a lot of research was focusing uh, not only on not only on strong consistency, but on things like Byzantine fault tolerance uh, and stuff like that. And so then Dynamo comes along, and they say, not only do we not care about Byzantine fault tolerance, we don't even care about strong consistency. And so this was somewhat revolutionary. Uh, and it, it was very influential in, in many systems that came later. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, a good comment in chat. So, um, so yeah. At the time, um, the there was there was a great deal of focus on uh, on ensuring a strong consistency, uh, no matter what. And um, uh, so, so the comment in chat is is that the Dynamo um, uh, came at a time when some companies were doing a, a lot of over-engineering for fault tolerance. Uh, and so if, if you choose to take this approach um, of, uh, of prioritizing availability, uh, even under network partitions, then you're kind of just saying, look, network partitions are a fact of life. Because if you prioritize consistency, right? Um, if you prioritize consistency, uh, then that means that Replica2 has to say, I can't tell you to the client, or they can't respond at all, um, uh, right? So if strong consistency is a given, if you know that you have to have strong consistency, then you're going to do all the work that you can to try to minimize uh, partitions, right? And so, well, that costs a lot. It's... it's um, and it's and, and it's not necessarily the best investment of your resources, right? When it might actually be okay for the client to get a slightly stale value of X, right? So that was the choice that Amazon made. They said, it's most important that the client receives a value here. It's most important that we respond to the client's request. If the response to the client's request is a little bit stale, so be it. And that ended up being the right choice, the, the right trade-off for their particular circumstances. And that was, that was hugely influential on a lot of other systems. All right, uh, let's wrap up for today. Uh, we'll talk about Dynamo a lot more next time. See you next week. Have a great weekend.